everyone. So really great to see you all. Um, yeah, so it's great to be here on the on day two of the HERO Summit. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Alex Miolides. Um, he is not here in person today, which means that I can say whatever I want about him, but no, that's, that's no, I'm, I'm just kidding. Um, Alex is a professor in the Department of Occupational Science and Occupational Therapy and the Institute of Biomedical Engineering. Um, and he is the Barbara G. Stymius Research Chair in Rehabilitation Technology at the University of Toronto and Toronto Rehabilitation Institute. And he is uh, the Scientific Director of the AgeWell Network of Centers of Excellence, which focuses on the development of uh, new technologies and services for older adults. Um, and in addition to that, he is the Associate Vice President of International Partnerships at the University of Toronto. And so it's a great pleasure. He's a world-renowned researcher um, in assistive technology for older adults with cognitive impairments, uh, smart home systems, intelligent systems, um, artificial intelligence, and robotics in health, rehabilitation, and wellness. He's also um, an award-winning teacher and a mentor of trainees and a true champion of his colleagues. Um, it's an honor and to work with him. Um, I hope you enjoy his presentation and take up his offer to chat with him um, uh, at any point. So send him an email um, if you would like to chat. So, all right, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk today to you all at the Robotics Institute. I apologize that I'm not here live via Zoom, but that I had to pre-record this. Today, I'd like to talk a little bit about what we're doing in the area of robotics for rehabilitation, and specifically what is happening over at Toronto Rehab and members of the Robotics Institute that are also scientists there. Before I move on, I'd like to first acknowledge the team members who have all contributed to this work and to this presentation. Dr. Aaron Yurkovich, who's a former uh, doctoral student with us, Dr. Rosalie Wang in the Department of Occupational Therapy, Dr. Rezo Alam, who's a postdoc fellow with us, and Dr. Jose Zarifa, who's a scientist at Toronto Rehab and a professor within biomedical engineering. I also like to acknowledge Professor Debbie Bear, who passed away last year. Professor Bear was a OT and a practice lead at Toronto Rehab, and she really was the clinical lead and inspiration for all the work that you're going to see here today. So first of all, what is Toronto Rehab or KITE, which is the new research institute? Toronto Rehab is Canada's largest academic rehab hospital for adults across six clinical programs, as you see right here. But perhaps most importantly for this presentation is the fact that Toronto Rehab is also one of the largest and best research centers in the world with respect to rehabilitation. And technology plays a key role here. In terms of who we are, we are scientists who are dedicated to improving the lives of people living with the effects of disability, illness, and aging. More specifically, our research focuses across three different areas. This includes injury prevention, restoration of function, and enhanced participation in independent living. As you can see at Toronto Rehab, we actually have a very wide ranging definition of rehabilitation. We believe rehab doesn't start just right after your injury, but actually starts with injury prevention. Now, some of you uh, may have seen the various facilities we have over at Toronto Rehab Kite. Uh, for example, we have Street Lab, which is shown um, in this top corner here, which allows us to do a 360 degree visual surround um, of a streetscape that we can build and hence allowing people to interact with the environment as they're perhaps walking down the sidewalk or something. Uh, we have Driver Lab, which is our newest research lab, and this is a fully automated driving simulator with, in fact, an actual car uh, that is in the lab itself. We then have Winter Lab, which allows us to do things such as test uh, winter footwear, um, winter clothing, the mobility of various types of assistive technologies on ice surfaces and other things. Uh, Stair Lab, it does a lot of work around standards uh, to develop different things such as handrails, and the size and scope of stair design. Uh, home lab, uh, which is the primary lab that my group works in, is a fully simulated house that allows us to do work around smart uh, home research, et cetera. And finally, there's care lab, which simulates a full patient room. And as 
uh, a member site of the Robotics Institute, you all have access to these facilities. Uh, as you can imagine, once we can reopen uh, because of COVID. So let's get specific to how we're using robotics and rehab and at Toronto Rehab. So we're focused on helping our clients maintain, return, and enhance their abilities to engage in daily activities. And this may be anything from self-care activities to something that we take for granted uh, without a disability, such as preparing a cup of tea or making a meal or changing our clothes. Within the area of rehab robotics, we are looking at a variety of areas, specifically across two areas, physical rehab and cognitive rehab. Our work in physical rehab has been going on for many years. The work on cognitive rehab is brand new. And so I'll show you one of the, the projects later on in this talk. So let's start with physical rehabilitation. So physical rehab uh, can cut across a wide range of various aspects and injuries, anything from spinal cord injury to what we focus on and that is stroke. Now the current state of physical therapy in Canada for stroke rehab um, is actually not that great. Typically, most of your therapy happens in the first six months. Uh, we then have uh, problems in terms of access to stroke rehab. Once you are discharged from the hospital, you return to home. Obviously, we have disparity across socioeconomic um, statuses. We have disparity across geographic locations and others that we're looking at. In terms of the, the paradigm or the spectrum of stroke rehab, typically you start as an inpatient, then you move to an outpatient. Hopefully at that point, you're getting community-based rehab. And then beyond that, and typically after those six months or seven months, it's all about home-based rehab. Now, the problem with stroke rehab is it's difficult. Um, as you can see here in this picture, Typically, it involves you know, common objects that you find around the physical therapy gym or in your home, and you're really doing makeshift ad hoc exercises to mimic the type of rehab you would formally receive while you're in the hospital. If we had to summarize stroke rehab, though, why it's so difficult, um, basically, it is very repetitive. It's very labor intensive. Uh, it's limited to one-on-one -on -one therapist patient time, so it's very difficult for a therapist to work across multiple patients. Uh, there's various economic pressures within the hospitals, especially these days. Um, and then when you get to home rehab, it is self-directed, and there's very little, little professional or quantitative feedback. And so because of that, what we actually see is very poor exercise adherence at home. Um, as you can see in one of the studies here, it's about 65 uh, adherents to at least some part of their therapy. Now, because of this and the need to perhaps um, quote unquote automate some of this therapy, the role of robotics has actually started to be recognized in various practices. So for example, if you look at the stroke best practices that were developed in Canada a couple of years ago, they actually have a section around how robotics can play a role in providing therapy. And again, here's a quote, robotics are an emerging developing area in stroke, in stroke rehab programs should begin to build capacity to integrate robotic technology into stroke rehab therapy to appropriate patients as the research evidence suggests and in the future incorporate this therapy as part of comprehensive therapy where available. Now you notice there are three parts here that are highlighted and it really is about capacity, understanding the type of patient we're working with and how to provide this therapy, where and when robotics will be available. So as probably most of you know, rehab robotics is nothing new. There's actually been a lot of research being done on this area for at least a couple of decades. There have been a variety of robots that have actually been developed, as you can see um, some examples on this uh, slide right here. In fact, we're actually now at the point where you can buy a rehab robot on Alibaba. Uh, you just go ahead, you don't need a prescription, you don't need a physical therapist, um, and you can go ahead and just buy this uh, exoskeleton here to do uh, upper limb rehab. Now, as you can imagine, beyond some of the challenges that you are, can think about right now without having a therapist involved in any of this, one of the primary issues with rehab robotics is that they're very, very expensive. The rehab robots I showed on the previous page, uh, this one, others that are out there, typically are anywhere from $100,000 up to half a million US if you want to include all the bells and whistles. 
So as you can imagine with this price point, rehab robots are not being purchased by hospitals across the, you know, the globe right now. You know, at Toronto Rehab, we have one or two, which are prototypes we built um, across the city. There are actually very few number of rehab robots that are available. And this is very similar across other major, ur major urban centers and hospitals. And as you can imagine, rural locations where perhaps rehab robots can have the greatest impact, um, there, are, there, there are none being used right now. So in the work that we're doing, uh, one of the main things we want to do is to increase the value add of robots. And this includes um, coming up with better um, ways to quantify performance changes um, in order to show how robots can be superior to current clinical measures and using the various sensors on robots that will allow us to um, collect more data. Um, the value add that we're also adding, obviously making them more mo motivated. We're working with various uh, researchers and companies in game design to help come up with more engaging games and interfaces to encourage, but more importantly, to provide real-time feedback to the patients. Uh, we're trying to make these robots adaptive uh, and intelligent so that therapists do not need to be constantly present. We're not saying to cut the therapist completely out of the loop, but to make the robot itself using things such as machine learning to adapt its exercises automatically. Um, and the whole goal of this is that, you know, the therapists then don't have to sit there and do that back and forth arm motion with the patient over, over and over again. But then after the robot provides that kind of training, therapists can fo focus more on the functional activity training and the community integration as well. Now, the other major value add here is obviously cost. So one thing I will talk about later on is how do we drive the cost of these robots down from hundreds of thousands of dollars to ideally only thousands of dollars or better yet, hundreds of dollars itself. So before I talk about some of the work that we're doing around rehab robots, just to show you that there is also some strong clinical evidence that shows that rehab robots can actually have a positive impact on the clinical indicators for people with stroke and even other types of injuries as well. Here are two, some of the major studies that are out there. One is a Cochrane systematic review, and the other one is a systematic and meta-analysis of all the types of uh, clinical trials that did occur. And I'm not gonna go over the, the data here in detail, but basically what you see here is that there has been improvements in such things as arm muscle strength, arm function, in the completion of generic activities of daily living. And there's also been improved motor control, um, significant but small according to the study. And again, also showing changes in muscle strength. Now, when we started off our project a few years ago, we wanted to start with a very user-centered design approach. And so the first thing we wanted to do was to really understand what do clinicians want? What do clinicians want to use the robot for in their therapy and, and what functions and, and features do they want it to include? So we went out, we did very large scale international surveys across many different uh, countries, um, also including physical therapists and occupational therapists. And what we found obviously is things such as in terms of aims of rehab, obviously a lot of them show that it's very important to facilitate functional activities prevent further injury or complications, improve coordinations and other aspects that help to learn normal muscle movement. Now, in terms of uh, facilitation of movement and some of the functions and features that therapists want to see in the robots, again, we saw them strongly agree or uh, somewhat agree across a variety of tasks and functions. For example, that needs to be task oriented training and practice um, that the strokes of ours still need the one-on-one -on -one therapy sessions. However, that robots can also provide some of that aspect. They want the robotic devices to perform these repetitive tasks in a single training session with a clear functional goal. And obviously that um, they also agree that robots can provide some high intensity focus therapy. So with respect to the work we started, we, we have done work on robotics on three areas of the upper limb or the arm. And where I'm gonna start is with the upper arm part, which as you can see in this shaded diagram includes the shoulder, the elbow, the biceps, uh, right down to the wrist. So we developed in partnership a rehab robot that can provide range of motion um, 
and power a fully uh, functioning arm. It has very low inertia, friction, and backlash based on the design that we went through, which I'm not going to get into. Uh, we want to make sure that we reduce its size and its weight. None of the robots that I've shown you before can actually be picked up by physical therapists and moved uh, from patient room to patient room. The one we designed can be. We want something that's easy and safe to set up and most importantly, affordable. Um, and we aim this to be in the area of 10 to $12,000 Canadian. So this is a picture of the third generation rehab robot that you can see. Um, basically it is a tabletop robot with an LCD monitor on top that uh, provides various games and motivation and feedback. Uh, it has a fully haptic robotic arm that provides uh, force feedback, it provides resistance, but it also provides assistance as well. In terms of the design, we worked with a local company called Kwanzer in order to drive the cost down. And so we worked with them to come up with a very simple mechanism uh, approach that reduces as many moving parts um, and the use of various expensive motors as needed in order still though to provide a fully powered uh, robotic device. Now at this point, I'm gonna show you a video where you're gonna meet Dr. Rosalie Wang and she'll talk a little bit about what the robotic device does. And spiel about doing this type of uh, study. And I'm also looking at another program that is an intense therapy program combining robotics and uh, homework and goal setting for clients. So this is our stroke rehab robot. So it sits with a wide open workspace and it has a robotic arm that the patient can use to do exercises. The arm can move really freely or it can give assistance or resistance when meeting a target. So the therapist can set up exercise programs tailored to the individual patient with targets aimed to promote natural motion, to, exchange, to extend range of motion, and to build strength. The system produces a variety of reports that can be reviewed by the therapist and the patient that track progress over time. Receiving uh, therapy as soon as possible after a We'll just skip uh, that guy because you're getting enough of him right now in the presentation. So we went through and we conducted various clinical and usability studies of that rehab robot. And just to give you a sampling here, uh, the, the main um, measurement that occupational therapists and physical therapists use for the upper extremity of the arm is the Fugelmeyer scale. And as you can see over time with this particular participant, there was an increase in terms of the Fugelmeyer uh, score. It was small, but it's still clinically significant. And also we saw an increase in active range of motion. You see the same thing for participant two here as an example, where we see overall an increase in their functionality. Now, some of the other key findings from the studies that we conducted, and we conducted about four or five different studies across the different types of robots we built for the upper arm, um, is first of all, with respect to usability and outpatient studies, it showed that robotic therapy with a therapist is enjoyable, uh, useful and safe. Um, what we also found is that with a robot, about one hour um, a session, three to four times per week, was manageable and was satisfying for chronic outpatient stroke survivors. Um, and as like with any kind of pilot study, we currently have low sample size, but we have more studies to come. Um, but what we're starting to see are possibly moderate uh, positive effects. We're also trying to understand the need for more task-specific hand and wrist movements, as I'll show you, and whether this is actually possibly too staff intensive. So one thing we heard from some of the therapists in the hospital that were using the robot is that it took a lot to set up the device to get the patients going um, and then to monitor what they're doing. So that's something we will wanna work on as well moving forward. Now, as we move down the arm, one thing we did is we wanted to develop a module uh, that would just connect to the existing upper limb robot that would provide also wrist um, and um, lower arm um, activation and increase in strength. So what we de developed is this little device you see here with a support glider on it so that you can actually still do wrist exercises along with the upper arm. And then we have a fully haptic uh, handle that um, allows the person to do the various exercises. So once again here, what I'll do is I'll show a video of this device working. So as you can see here, the person is doing their various exercises uh, to assess what their current range of motion is. 
Um, the person would also have some kind of visual feedback, uh, like with the overall device you see here. And then in terms of exercises, um, similar to the upper arm robot itself, the person is watching a game here and is doing various types of wrist motions back and forth. Now, in terms of some quick clinical findings from the study we completed with that device itself, again, if you look at range of motion with respect to clockwise and counterclockwise, we do see increases uh, with our participants um, from the robot itself. And you look at the amount of torque uh, that the person can apply through the wrist, again, we're seeing increases from the use of the robot. Now, the final robot we developed left for limb was around the hand. And this was something that therapists brought to us and said, you know, this is great that we can get the upper arm going, but if they can't use their fingers, if they can't get out of a, the typical grasp that they're in, which is this post-stroke, then they can't actually do anything functional. They can't pick up a glass, they can't get themselves dressed, they can't bathe themselves, et cetera. And in fact, this is actually a big problem as you see on this slide right now, that one third of stroke survivors actually do not regain hand, hand function nor complete daily activities. Um, on average, they state they have at least five unmet occupational needs, and 83% of survivors report a significant decrease in quality of life because of poor hand function. So this was the work of my former PhD student, uh, Aaron Yurkovich, uh, who's a postdoc now in the UK, and he wanted to take a truly user-centered approach and also an open access approach to this as well. So he went through various iterations where he just iterated very, very quickly. He would build prototypes of devices that would be wearable to help with hand function, exoskeletons, he built things out of Lego, et cetera. And all along the way, he would do very rapid um, usability testing with patients, with therapists to get their feedback and to continue to iterate his work. Now, in terms of what he uh, developed, and I'll show you a video of Aaron talking about this in more detail, is what he calls the hero glove. So the hero glove itself assists hand opening and enhances grip strength through various types of motions. You can see here that there are these strips that help to bend the fingers into a grip position, for example, led by some motors. And again, on the palm side as well, there's some activation that's allowed that can actually help open and close the hand as needed. Um, Aaron made sure that it was portable, affordable, and easy to use. And as I mentioned, this was all open hardware and open source. In fact, right now with his final design, we have about 60 or 65 therapists around the world who have downloaded uh, the schematics to build their own hardware. And then Aaron has provided the software. So I'm gonna show you a video here. This is an actual patient. We do have full permission uh, to show him as part of this video. And as you'll see of using one of the prototypes itself, he is able to complete various uh, typical functions. This is one of the common tests uh, that are completed. Uh, up blocks and place them in a pattern. Uh, without the device, obviously, you will not be able to open any of the blocks, but with the device itself, you can manually activate it right now, it's allowing you to pick up the objects. And demonstrating some very uh, common activities, such as holding a bottle to pour. There, his hand function is so poor, he did need some assistance from a therapist. Right here, obviously grabbing and folding towels and doing something as simple as laundry, the device allowing him to do that. Something as simple as using a phone that you would not be able to do before um, in order to eat a meal. And again, the hand glove glove itself is allowing you to maintain that grip. So again, uh, through Aaron's results uh, clinically, he found that with the glove, uh, people are able to complete more activities more tasks, um, such as the ones you saw in the video itself. Uh, in terms of things like finger extension, range of motion, 
Uh, we saw significant increases in the number of degrees that the person was able to go through. Uh, grip strength, we saw um, significant changes where basically with the robot, they had some grip strength. Without it, they basically had nothing. Uh, with the box and block test, which is shown in this picture here, without the device, they weren't able to do anything. With the device, they're able to move three blocks. Um, and you'll see some other activities here. Now, the one thing is the satisfaction. So basically with um, across these 11 participants, they rated a three, which is more or less satisfied. So again, this is something that Aaron took into account to further iterate the device itself. One of the next things that Aaron has been working on now part of his postdoc is more automated ways to, uh, to work the glove. Uh, before we had a very simple sensor in there that would detect when the person moved their hand and then stop, indicating that they wanted to close their hand and then moving again, indicating they wanted to open it. What Aaron is now looking at is myoelectric uh, devices that uses obviously electrical signals from the muscles in the arm in order to operate the gloves. Soft wearable robots are advancing and merging the fields of rehabilitation and assistive technology to help millions of people recover hand function after stroke. And now squeeze as much as you can. And now relax. And now extend. And now relax. Squeeze. My hero is an untethered myoelectric control soft robotic relax. It provides five-finger grip assistance when the user attempts to grasp and five-finger extension assistance when the user relaxes the shoulder, elbow, wrist, and hand. Nine people with severe hand impairment after stroke completed a hand function assessment and 13 daily living tasks like holding a phone or toothbrush, doing up a zipper, and cutting food. With my hero, all nine participants surpassed clinically meaningful important differences on the hand function assessment, and four surpassed these differences on the daily living tasks. Nine participants incorporated their affected hand into more of these daily living tasks and performed them more independently. Like that. Yeah, I've never been able to do it. The majority of participants were satisfied with My Hero and found it to be useful and easy to use. Seven participants desired to use My Hero in the clinic and at home during their therapy and daily routines. Our developments and findings provide therapists and people after stroke with exciting opportunities for integrating myoelectric soft robotic gloves into their rehabilitation programs and daily routines. This will enable their independence and motivate greater use of the affected upper extremity to enhance recovery. This is the one that amazes me the most. And again, just allowing them to do simple everyday activities such as getting dressed, folding laundry, making a meal, anything that they weren't able to do before. Check out our paper and data set of forearm electromyography, acceleration, and orientation recordings collected during these hand function and daily living task assessments. And again, completely open source uh, in terms of the hardware and the software itself. So I'll finish off now by showing you one of our brand new projects where we're trying to use robotics in cognitive rehab as well, primarily for people with uh, dementia. So people who may have dementia or Alzheimer's disease or suspected Alzheimer's disease um, has to go through a variety of assessments in order to determine if they actually have the disease or not. And again, as we all know, uh, this is really truly not known until a person is deceased and they can do a post-mortem and they can actually see the shrinkage in the, in the brain itself that shows Alzheimer's disease. However, one thing that is well known in, in studies is the impact of cognitive impairment on language problems. And what we see is as a person's cognitive impairment increases, 
um, obviously they're going to have greater language problems as well. Now, this has been used uh, not only obviously to see if a person is progressing, but to assess a person's level of cognitive impairment to determine whether the person may have dementia or not, and also then to perform rehabilitation to help the person improve in some of those language functions and speech areas. What I'm gonna show you here is an example we're doing with um, another researcher, Frank Rudzik, um, who is very well known here at U of T and around the world in terms of speech recognition and a lot of the work that he's been doing on doing things such as having an older adult with dementia just describe back what they're seeing in the picture and then automatically analyzing their speech to determine whether the person may have dementia, the level of severity of the cognitive impairment, and again, to apply rehabilitation. So we've been working with Frank uh, to apply that to a robotic platform. Many of you may recognize Pepper here. Um, and so what I'll do is I'll just play the video so you can see uh, how well it's working. My name is Pepper. Today I will be guiding you through a simple test to for dementia. In a few moments, I will show you a picture on my tablet. All you need to do is describe what you see. Let's get started. Doing the dishes. And he's into the cookie jar for his sister. And she let the water run over in the sink. Great job. Thanks for doing this together with me. That was a lot of fun. While we wait, let me tell you more about this test. Just now I showed you a picture on my tablet and asked you to describe it to me. Your response can tell us more about how you express what you see. Sometimes we can use these results to screen if someone may be at risk of developing dementia. Remember, the results of this test are only for screening. So you will have to see your doctor for more accurate results. Thank you for your patience. Your results show some differences between other healthy participants. Since this is only a screening, it might be a good idea to speak with your doctor for more accurate results. So as you saw there, basically the picture was displayed uh, Pepper listened to what the person was saying, and then using the algorithms and approaches that Frank Rudzik and his team have developed, uh, we did an automatic analysis and the robot provides um, the information back. So the next study we actually want to do in this area is to determine, you know, does an embodied approach like this improve the usability, uh, the satisfaction of using this type of device as opposed to just doing it over an iPad? So we are looking at various modalities as well moving forward. So to finish off in summary, um, hopefully you've enjoyed seeing some of the examples of the work we're doing with robotics uh, in, in the field of rehabilitation. That's part of the Robotics Institute. Um, as I described, rehab robotics is not a new field, but it's only really recently, as we're starting to see more devices and the price of these things come down, that they're starting to gain traction in clinical applications and settings. Um, however, we still need to move towards new design approaches in order to ensure that were meeting the needs of our clients and the clinicians themselves. So user sense of design approach really, really is important to continue to move forward. However, at the end of the day, no matter what we build and all the great work we do and all the cool devices we develop, cost is gonna be the primary limiting factor. Hospitals have small budgets for technology, if any. Um, home healthcare uh, networks and companies, again, have very small budgets, um, especially these days with everything that's going on. And so we really need to be figuring out how do we move these technologies from these very expensive healthcare devices to new consumer dri uh, driven approaches and, and devices. And I show one picture here um, of one of these new uh, fads, which are kind of these walls or these mirror uh, devices to help you do exercise. And I show this uh, not because this is a good example of something, but it is actually a good example of the way they have moved exercise equipment into everyday um, furniture, essentially, and part of everyday living. And at the same time, how they're driving the cost down. And in my opinion, this is the same thing we need to do in the rehabilitation field. We need to take these devices from looking very medical-based, um, as I said, high cost, and turn them into something that's elegant looking like the picture you see here. It will only be at that point that I feel that will get true traction in the area of rehab robotics, um, but, 
Thank goodness here at the Robotics Institute and University of Toronto and our affiliate hospitals, we're all working towards this problem. So with that, I thank you very much for having me. Again, I apologize. I can't be here on uh, Zoom with you to answer any questions, but please feel free to email me. Uh, my email address is at the bottom, along as our lab web address and my Twitter handle. And I look forward to ongoing relationships and being part of the Toronto um, University of Toronto Robotics Institute. Thanks very much, everyone.